It's time for the Word of God. Let's everybody turn to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24. And we all know that 1 Samuel is right before 2 Samuel. Good, 2 Samuel. So go to 1 Samuel so it's easy to find, right? All you have to do is find 2 Samuel and then go one book before. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel 24, and we'll read verses 1 uh, through 7. 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 7. Well, that was fast. Okay, uh, let's read it together. Ready, begin. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave and went his way. Amen. Uh, this is a situation in which King Saul is out to hurt David, wants to kill him. King Saul, who has all this power and authority, who has 3,000 chosen men from all Israel looking to get David. Um, have you ever felt that way where you feel like everybody's out to get you and you're not being paranoid? But it's actually true. It's like people are against you. And people, and, and it might not even be people. It might just be your situation in life where things are happening in your life where everything is negative. Everything is bad, right? All the news that you hear is bad. Personal news about yourself, things that are happening in your life with your friends, um, you know, with your parents, with the school grades, things like this. Like everything seems to be the weather, right? Everything seems to be going against you. Ever feel that way? And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing that, that you can control. It's out of your hands, and, and it just keeps coming. And you, you're just like, ah. And, and what do you do in those kinds of situations? Hopefully, you pray, right? And you, you rely on the Lord. Hopefully, you say, God, please help me. Look at the situation. Look at the news that I'm hearing. Look at uh, the things that I'm going through in my life. God, please help me. You ever feel this way? Maybe it's not so dramatic for you, you know? It's not like 3,000 chosen assassins coming to get you. Maybe it's not that dramatic, but still it's tough. It's hard when things aren't going your way, when you had all kinds of expectations and things that you were looking forward to in life. And they just don't happen, or things fall apart, or things break down. Hopefully, during those times, you pray to God. When I was a senior in high school, and my sister, who was a junior in high school, when she ran away from home, and all these things were happening, and uh, you know, I was, uh, I was kind of growing as a Christian at the time. I was growing in faith. And so one of the things I did was I prayed to God, God, please help me, help my family. Look at all these things, one, at, you know, one after the other, things are just happening, right? My sister runs away from home, and if, it's, if that's not bad enough, right, she tells her school counselor that uh, she's suffering mental abuse from home, right? And then so they, they come to our house, the cops come to our house in the middle of the night. How could they always come in the middle of the night, right? Uh, and, and they uh, arrest my dad for, you know, know, child, whatever, endangerment, abuse, whatever, things like this, right? One thing after the other, right? 
And so then to get him out of jail before the trial, we have to pay the bail, right? We pay, uh, pay like all this money, and now we owe this money. So then my mom uh, has to get a job going door to door selling jewelry to Korean ladies who work in these factories in, in downtown LA. And she's going door to door with a case of jewelry, right? And saying, would you buy this? Would you buy this? Would you buy this? Right? And then one of those days, uh, this, these gangsters come and they attack her. They steal her stuff. I mean, just one thing after another. Sounds like a movie, huh? Senior year in high school. That's how I spent my senior year in high school. This is when I was doing my college apps. One thing after another, and there's nothing I can do about this. And so all I can do is pray. I was in a desperate situation. Have you ever been in a desperate situation where all you could do is pray? And all you can do, is, and in your prayer, you ask, God, how is this your will for me in my life? Right? Which is pretty selfish, right? My dad's in jail. My sister thinks she's being mentally and emotionally scarred and abused. And my mom is being attacked. And, all, and I'm thinking, how can you do this to me? God, how is this your will for my life? That's pretty selfish. Uh, but I was young. I was 18, 17, 18. I was young. I was selfish. God, how is this your will for my life, for my family? And how come there's nothing I can do about this? How come there's nothing I can control about this? Ever been in that kind of situation? And we pray. We see David being pursued by the king of Israel with 3,000 trained, you know, whatever, assassins, killers, uh, hunters, whatever. And he's in a lot of danger. But something happens in the middle of all of this that seems like God's answer to prayer. Right? He, uh, David and his men are hiding inside, deep inside of a cave, and Saul and his men are outside, and Saul decides, well, not decides, but, you know, nature calls, right? He has to do number two. And so then he goes into the cave, and the men are way in the back of the cave hiding, and David is there. And look at verse 3. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Verse 4, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with you as you wish. Another translation says, isn't this the day? Isn't this God's will for you right now? Isn't this the day that God has chosen for you to deal with your enemy? This is God's opportunity for you to get out of this terrible situation that you're in. When we go through hardships and difficulties, when we go through, when things are just really, you know, messed up in our lives, we look for ways to get out of it. We look for ways to, to solve this situation. You're right, guys, right? We're all into like solving problems, right? The difference between guys and girls, right? When, when girls have problems and they tell you about it, what do they want? For you to just listen, right? And guys, when, when, you know, when we talk about problems, what do we want? We want to solve it, right? Like, what's the issue? Here's the issue. Let's solve it, right? And that's what these men are doing right now. They're saying to David, hey, see this problem that we have right now? This great big problem when all of our lives are in danger? Here's the solution. When we go through hardships and difficulties, we look for Ways to solve that problem. Ways to avoid that situation. Especially when, for such a long time, there was nothing we can do about it. For such a long time, metaphorically, you know, we've been running away, running away, running away. And then here comes an opportunity for us to solve the problem. And that's what David and his men are experiencing right now. We can end it right here. Look, the king is like totally defenseless, right? He's like he pooping and, and he's like totally defined. We have all these men back here. We could get rid of him right now. This is God's answer to prayer. This is God giving you an opportunity to get out of this mess that you're in. Verse 5, oh, well, if you were in that situation, 
what would you do? And, and let's say not even David and Saul, but le- like in a situation where things are always bad in your life, and you only hear bad news, and then comes an opportunity for you to do something to get rid of that situation, to improve your life, what would you do? How would you decide whether or not to do this opportunity that's been given to you? What would you do? You know, uh, when all of these things are happening in my life, my senior year in high school, right? Um, I'm thinking about this. Back then, right? Uh, all these things are happening in my life, my senior year in high school, uh, and, and all these terrible things are happening, and, and things are not looking good. My dad had planted a church. He was a senior pastor of a church, and when that happened, everybody left the church, uh, and so we didn't have a church anymore. We didn't have a source of income. We didn't have friends. We didn't have anything. Everybody accusing my dad of, you know, hey, what's going on in your family and all that. I mean, it's just swirling around. And then I got accepted to college by God's grace, right? I got accepted to college. And what I did was I used college as kind of like a, an answer to th- this problem, solving my problem. I used co- what I did was I escaped to college. I ran away, right? But then the excuse was, hey, they, I got in, right? I got into college. I got to go to college. I got to go live in the dorms and things like this. So then I went, and I completely shut my mind uh, from the things that were going on at home. I mean, th- this thing took years with my sister and stuff. She's a juvenile, and she has to, and then she went into foster care and, and all this. I mean, this took years. And, and for me... I ran away. I thought this is God's answer to me. I don't know if I thought this was God's answer. I didn't even consider it. I just thought, oh, hey, look, I'm in college now, so I'm not going to, you know, whenever my parents wanted to talk about something, if they needed help with the lawyers and all these things, I would say, I'm busy. I'm a college student. And I escaped. And that was my answer to the problem. That was the way that I solved my problem. I thought this is God's way of, you know, by his grace. I don't know. And so here's David who could end his problems right now just by doing this one thing. Not only was he thinking about it, but all of his men, his friends were supporting him in this situation. And they brought up God's name. They said, this is God's will for you. This is God's opportunity for you. Man, everything seems to click, right? Yeah, the opportunity is there. My friends support me. And God, you know, they used God. And so then everything clicks, and so maybe I should do this thing. And David was tempted. Here's the thing. When we are in trouble and when we go through hardships and there's an opportunity for us to end it all, something happens, something, you know, some kind of opportunity comes, do we ever consider if this is God's will for me? Do we ever consider, is this the way that God wants me to handle this situation? For me, it was just running away from the situation. Is that the way God wanted me to handle this? Right? If your friends are bothering you, if your friends are, uh, you know, and you have an opportunity to, to discredit them, you have the opportunity to, you know, you found out something terrible about this person who's bothering you, and all you have to do is let other people know. Right? This person is bothering you, accusing you of stuff and whatever, and then you found out something about this person that if everybody knows, that's it, game over, man. You're, and, and, and you have the opportunity to post it somewhere. Would you do it? Is that God? Thank you, Lord, for, for giving me this information about this person. This person will never bother me ever again. Is that God's will for you? Do you even consider that? You guys, be very careful about what you post online, right? People, uh, because 20 years from now, somebody's going to bring it up, right? It's happening, I don't know if you guys watch the news, um, but it happens all the time where somebody gets selected to something like, you know, you know, like Saturday Night Live, right? Do you guys watch Saturday Night Live? When I was younger, it was a big thing. It was a huge thing, right? This guy, he gets uh, picked, chosen to be, you know, uh, in Saturday Night Live, and then he's all happy about it, and then they found, they found something racist or, or whatever that he said like 15 years ago. 
and then they fired him before he even started. Most recently, there was a guy who was really um, popular on social media, right? What he did was during a college football game or something like that, he said, hey, I need money for beer. And he does the, the beer uh, uh, product name and his Venmo and stuff. And then people started to send him money. And so he decides, you know what? I'm not going to buy beer with all this money, right? So he decides to donate this money to Children's Hospital, right? And then the beer company decides, hey, we're gonna, whatever you raise, we're going to match that, and we're going we're gonna to donate it to Children's Hospital. And Venmo decides, we're going to match that. We're gonna and so then he ended up raising a million dollars, way over a million dollars for the Children's Hospital. And the beer company, they're like, oh, we'll give you a year's worth of you know, our beer and then all this stuff, right? And then they find a tweet or whatever, something that he said from when he was a teenager. Right, and uh, and it's on the news. It's in the newspaper that he he uh, he said this thing when and and then so then what happens? The beer company said, okay, we're going to give you a year's supply of beer and stuff like. We're still going to donate the money, but we don't want anything to do with you anymore because of something he posted years ago. And then the reporter who reported this. In the newspaper, he said, yeah, this guy, you know, many years ago when he was a teenager, he did this. Somebody found a tweet that this reporter did 15 years ago or whatever, and he got fired. Be very careful what you guys post online. But sometimes we want to do this. We found out about something about somebody. Somebody who's been bothering me, somebody who's been, and all I have to do is let people know, and this problem is solved. Is that God's will for you? Taking revenge. Is that God's will for you? Taking the easy way out. Lying, cheating. How many times have we gotten out of trouble by lying? For me, too many to count. Where I'm in trouble, I'm about to get in trouble, something's going to happen, and I just kind of lie a little bit. God, thank you for giving me the brains to, to, to come up with this story. This is great, and I can get out of this trouble. How many times has that happened to you? Here, David, is in, his life is in danger, and it looks like from all, you know, from, from everything that he sees, it looks like this might be God's answer, except for one thing. See, he was so tempted, and he, was, he just wanted to do this so badly that he goes and he cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. Why does he do this? To show that he could have killed Saul later? No, that's, I don't think that's the reason why he does it. I think he does it to see if he can get away with it. To see if that opportunity is really there. And he cut, he, I, I think in his heart he intended to do some harm. Everybody's telling him it's okay. In fact, they're saying this might be God's will for you. God-given opportunity. And so he goes and he cuts the corner of Saul's robe. Look at verse 5. Then David went out of the cave. No, 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 verse 5. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken. See, all of the, the situation and what his friends were saying and, and, you know, that they even invoked God's name and, you know, all of this seems to point to this is God's solution for you except for one thing, his conscience, his heart, what he knew of God. He could have killed Saul. He cut off the robe and nobody knew. He did. Saul didn't know. He had the opportunity and he wanted to do it. He could have done it. And all the, the outside situation, circumstances seem to point to this being God-given opportunities for him. Except for one thing, his conscience. 
he knew deep down in his heart this was wrong. You know what I do when my conscience is stricken, when I'm about to do something and I know it's wrong and, and God's kind of pointing to me, you know, that something, you know, and when, when that happens, you know what I do? I ignore it. Or I argue with myself. Oh, you're just being too sensitive. You're just being too holy moly. Oh, you're being, you know, it's like I argue with myself or I try to ignore it. When God is clearly speaking to my conscience. You know? When, I don't know if this ever happens, but, you know, when I was in high school, my, maybe it was in college, and I, and I was about to go out at night with somebody, and, and I thought, maybe I shouldn't go, maybe I should go, I don't know, maybe I should, but I go, ah, you know, the conscience or whatever, but I'm like, ah, no, God give an opportunity. I get into the car, and then I try to start the car to go, ging, 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 and it doesn't start, right? And to me, that's like, God is telling me, don't go, Right? And so what should I do? Oh, my goodness, God, thank you so much. I almost made a huge mistake, and I should just go back home. But what do I do? What's wrong with this car? Right? And I'm doing this. When God is clearly telling you that whatever opportunity, quote, unquote, that this seems to be is not given by me. This is not what I want you to do. He speaks to us in so many different ways, and he speaks to us in our conscience. And so many times we ignore it or we argue it away. Right? We try to rationalize. David cuts off a piece of Saul's robe, realizes, I can do this. I can kill this guy right now. And he had that intention. But having that intention, he didn't actually do it, guys. He didn't actually hurt him or harm him or kill him. He didn't go through with it. And yet, because he thought about it, because he considered it, because he went so close to it, he was conscience-stricken. And that's a blessing from God. When you feel guilty all the time, when you feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, ah, da, 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 you actually, that's a gift from God. It's a, it's a protection for you to keep you from sinning, to keep you from going against God's will. Why would we ignore it? Why would we try to argue against it? And so David was conscience stricken. And so look what he does. Look how he, um, look how he reacts to that. Afterwards, verse 5, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my head against him, for he's anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. A lot of times, we're satisfied with our own correct decision making our own good actions. God is telling me in my heart, do not attack this man, so I won't. You guys could do whatever you want. As for me, I'm not going to do it. And we're satisfied with that. I'm following God's will. I'm following God's command, so I'm good. You guys could do whatever you want. It's not on me. It's on you. That's not what David, David doesn't just say, God forbid me from doing this to this man. He also rebukes his men. He rebukes his friends and says, you are not allowed to harm him. Notice his influence on the people around him. It wasn't just about him himself disobeying God. He prevented his men from disobeying God. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Do you have that kind of influence in your circles, among your friends, amongst your family members? Or do you say, that's not my responsibility. They have their own minds. They have their own wills. And so they'll do whatever they want. At least for me, you know, I just won't sin. I'll, I'll just keep myself pure and clean. And for them, they could do, wow, is that, how is that, is that love? 
Do you love these friends of yours where, where you're, you're saying to them, yeah, go ahead, sin and get punished and go to hell. As long as I'm okay, I'm good. How's that love? So not only does David say, I'm not going to commit this sin, he prevents his men from committing that same sin. That is what Christians do. Oh, we're so self-satisfied many times. Ooh, I almost did this bad thing. I almost committed this sin, I, but I didn't. And then we observe while everybody else does it. How's that love? How is that care and concern? Oh, you know, it's their own minds and hearts and decision making and, you know, and, that, and it's their right, right? They have their right to do whatever they want and so me, I'm just going to stay out of it. And we use all these excuse, excuses not to get involved, not to show love, not to take risks, not to have responsibility over the people that we love. And we just let them do whatever thinking that we're actually being nice to them. David doesn't do that. He is conscience-stricken, not only for himself, but for what his men were about to do. And so he stops everybody from sinning against God. Now, to be fair, if David were not their leader... If he were just one of the followers, one of the minions, maybe he wouldn't have had that kind of influence, right? But David was the leader of these men. He had this kind of authority over his friends. And so he had that kind of influence, and so he was able to do that. Well, what can we get from that? You guys, stop being followers. Be a leader amongst your friends. Leading them into not sin and disobedience, but leading them into righteousness. I can't do it. I'm not. Put yourself in a position to do it. Nobody respects me. Well, put yourself in a situation where you are respected. What are some of the things that are keeping you from being respected? Is it because you lie and cheat? Is it because you're inconsistent? Is it because you're unreliable? Is it because you're lazy? Is it because you talk about people behind their backs? You know? When somebody comes to me and says, hey, pastor, pastor, you know what happened? This person did this and this and this and da 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 Right? When I hear it, do you know how I feel? I feel like, man, I can't trust you with a single thing. Because if you're saying all these things about these other people to me, what are you saying about me to all these other people? Oh. Huh. Whether we consciously think about it or not, that's the way we start to react to people who gossip, people who are lazy, who are inconsistent, who we don't respect them. We might not consciously think, oh, I'm not going to respect this person anymore. We might not consciously think that, but that's how it becomes because of our experiences with these people. Living this life, this, this life, this Christian life, is not simply about me being okay with God just by myself. As long as I make the right decisions and the right choices, and as long as I do God's will for me in my life, whoo, you know, I almost killed Saul. You know, I almost, whoo, but good thing I didn't. You know, my conscience was stricken and I made the right choice. Whoo, it doesn't end there. What is your influence amongst your friends, amongst your family members? How do you lead them? If you feel like you have no influence whatsoever, that's not acceptable. You can't just get down on yourself, oh, man, I have no power, I have no influence, nobody wants to listen to me, and every time I, you know, I always get voted down, and I, you know, I can't, uh, this is just the way my life is, so I'm just going to be okay with God just by myself, and then everything. That, that's not acceptable, you guys. Uh, 
There are so many things that we can do. The way we live our life, the way we speak, the kinds of decisions we make, the kinds of friends we make that would cause us to have more influence, that would cause us to have more respect. And we're not doing this. I'm not doing this so that I can have power and authority and I could have influence and people could look up to me and respect me. That's not why I want this. Right? I want this so that the people that I love, the people that I care about, will walk with me to the Lord. And if that means I have to study harder so that people will respect me for my academics, I'll study harder. If that means that I have to keep my mouth shut so that I don't gossip about other people to be, well, then I'll keep my mouth shut. If that means I have to go out of my way to serve people, to show that I'm not so selfish and self-serving, well, then that's what I'll do. Why? So that I could win them over. And why do I want to win them over? So that I can be popular? No. So that I could have the kind of influence that David had to bring people closer to God. This is a calling for all of us. Jesus told us to make disciples of all nations. How are you going to make disciples if nobody follows you? Nobody listens to you. Nobody cares about what you say. Because you've lost credibility because of the way that you talk, behave. Oh, I'm not a perfect person. I make so many mistakes, and so people see my mistakes, and then they, you know, that's true. We're, nobody's perfect. So I do make mistakes. I do, do do things wrong. But that doesn't disqualify me forever. I know some of you guys, I, I don't, you know, I don't have the right to say things to people because I make mistakes too. And I, you're not commanding people. We're influencing them through our actions, through our speech, through the way that we live our lives, through the decisions that we make. What's God's will for you as you're growing up? I want to challenge you guys to take command over your life. Stop being dragged by people all the time. Following them here, following them there, doing this, doing that, doing what everybody else does. I wish, I wish we had like some backbone like something you know like why do you have to do everything that everybody else does and that right now I sound just like my dad and I'm just like oh my goodness that's what he used to say to me you know when I used to slick my hair back and and tie my pants down here and then roll it up like this so it's tight around my ankles because that's what everybody else did that was the fashion right when I used to say these things that I, I would say that these cuss words that everybody else said and then you know and it would just cut uh, and I used to just follow it so I, I know what that is but you don't have to live your life like that what's God's will for you in your life it's not to go and follow people around but it's to lead, to bring people to Christ, grow up. This is not an impossible challenge, some ideal that we all hope for, but we all know we're never going to reach. No, that's not it at all. With the power that God gives us, with our obedience to Christ, All of these things 
are possible. Please remember who David was. He was a shepherd boy, the youngest of his family, absolutely ignored by his family. That's who he was. The only thing that made him, you know, the greatest king that Israel ever had was his obedience to God, the heart that he had. So let's do this. Learn how to say no to some of your friends, some of the things that are happening around you. Not only to say no, but also to be influential enough where you keep people from committing the sins that you almost committed. Be influencers in this world. Let's pray.